Today on The Daily Charge, in the market for a new television? You're in luck. TV guru David Katzmeyer is here to rank 2019's top models. Good morning and welcome to CNET's Daily Charge. It's Tuesday, July 23rd. I'm Ben Fox Rubin. I'm David Katzmeyer. Let's take a look at TVs. Okay, so Amazon's Prime Day ended last week, but suddenly you have a hankering for a new TV set. Uh, you're now asking yourself, what, what is the best time to, of the year to buy? I've got with me the United States expert on the subject. That is David Katzmeyer. David, thank you so much for coming. No problem. The newly rebranded 359. I'm psyched to be here. This is my first time. You yes. Know, I, I was, I was a, a regular, maybe sort of, sort of semi-regular guest last time, but this new studio. Phew, yes. I mean, this is wonderful. This yes, is awesome. we've upgraded, and thank you very much, BVG, for that. So let's jump into what everybody's here to know about. I want to talk to you about a little bit about timing. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked a little bit about this yesterday ahead of the show. We're talking about 2018 models versus 2019 models. Yep. It's kind of an interesting time of the year. In general, mm -hmm. you probably should wait if you do want to buy a TV. Is that right? Yeah, so Prime Day was a big deal. I mean, that's kind of like other other retailers besides Amazon were doing TV sales. So you, know, you saw Walmart, for example, Best Buy, all these guys are, are hitching onto that. So now that that's over, it's kind of like this uh, period. And, and it's not going to get really good in terms of TV price discounts until fall. Like yeah. November-ish, Black Friday-ish, that's when you're really going to start to see it. So, and the, and the 2019 models are, from, from what you know, at their highest level at this point in the year because they've just hit the market. Is that right? Yeah, so they kind of start coming out in you know, May, June uh, you know, for a lot of manufacturers, April. And then they're at their highest. But now they've come down a couple discounts. You, know, you start to see a little bit of price discounts. But you won't see the real savings if you're a savvy shopper, you want to wait. Yeah, OK. So y you also wrote about some timeless rules uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to buying on TVs. Let's talk about one of them, which I thought was really interesting, which right. is ignore the specs. Yeah. So TV specs are just there to confuse you. They're literally there to make you, you know, uh, go, oh, wow, that sounds really high tech. Where's my wallet? So it, it, these things like QLED, like uh, HD, all these things are they're, they're generally, especially if it has like a number attached to it, like mm -hmm. 960 motion rate, something like that, the higher the number, the crazier. Even 4K, I mean, they can be inherently confusing and not necessarily indicative of real image quality improvements, which is why we do these reviews and we actually sit down and compare them and figure okay. out which ones are actually worth looking at. So I would say trust the reviews, try to ignore the specs, don't base uh, your buying decision on a particular spec. So jumping off of that, mm -hmm. what should I base my buying decision on then? Well, main, the, one of the big things that really helps, again, if, if, ignoring OLED TVs, which we can get to a little bit, but if you're looking at, a, at an LCD, which is what most people People looking at what you can afford, full array local dimming is a really good picture quality step up. So that's what you start to see uh, in some Vizios, for example. Again, relatively inexpensive, but you get a really big image quality boost for that because it can localize the contrast, really improve pop, uh, you know, for a lot of different material. It really helps with HDR. So that's kind of the beginning. And speaking of HDR, it, it really, it's on all TVs and 4K on all TVs today. Don't think that just because it has 4K and HDR, it's going to give you necessarily a better picture. One of the other uh, elements that you talk about is bigger is actually better when it comes to televisions. Is oh, yeah. that right? Always. So uh, my, my general rule is, you know, buy as big of a TV as you can fit into your space and, you know, that your family will allow you to. So you want to, you want to be in this position where... Uh, you know, uh, six months down the road, you don't go, oh man, I really wish I had a bigger TV. Mm. And they're so inexpensive now for that, that next step up in screen size. I say 65 is kind of the new 55. And of course it varies if you're in an apartment or something like that, in a dorm or whatever. If you, you can't fit it in, obviously right. don't, but right. otherwise try to push out as much as you can. Uh, yeah, another way to think about it is instead of spending extra money on a new feature or something like that that'll get to a different price point, spend that extra money on a, on a larger size. Yeah. Uh, okay, so anybody that's been listening to this that is uh, maybe a little confused, not sure if I should pay attention to this element or that element, let's just make it dead simple for everybody. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about like the three TVs that you should buy if you don't want to pay attention to any of this other advice. Yeah, so we'll start with the least expensive. And, and uh, the last couple of years we've been talking about the rise of TCL, which is a brand that makes these Roku TVs that are ridiculously popular and for good reason. We like them a lot. Their least expensive Roku TVs like a 
32 inch for 130 bucks. Uh, you can get up to 55 inch for like, what, 330. So these are really inexpensive TVs. And they have a great built-in Roku operating system. So they make it super easy to stream Netflix, uh, Amazon, a million different other apps. And that's really what you want in an inexpensive TV is not have to muck around with a streamer, a separate remote, all this other stuff. You want it right there. The picture quality is decent enough for most people. Boom, you're done and out the door. The bump up is the 6 Series, which you also recommend. And then I believe if you've got the money, mm -hmm. what is it, an OLED from LG? Is that yeah, right? Yeah, so OLEDs, they're like the pinnacle in picture quality. And, you know, that, that 6 Series is a really great TV for the money. But, you know, no, no uh, LCD TV is going to be able to compete with the LG OLED. Of course, they are really expensive. You know, they start at about 1600 for a 55 inch right now. Prices will come down, as we mentioned a little bit later. But, you know, still, it's, it's a lot of money to spend yeah. on TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's quite a bit. Okay, so that is a thorough rundown, Cats, for anybody who wants to dig a little deeper. We do have links through uh, to all of David's reviews of all these TVs we talked about today down in the description below. Uh, thanks, as always, for everybody for joining us here live. We stream weekday mornings at 10.15 a.m. on YouTube, Periscope, and CNET.com slash Daily Charge. If you get a chance, please make sure to like, subscribe, and follow us on Twitter while we grow our channel. Uh, but since we know from experience that our audience base is perpetually thirsty for the best and newest TVs, let's go ahead and get to the reason everyone's here today, which is the Q&A portion with David. BBG, what are the people asking about? Well, the people want to know about how to get the most bang for their buck as per usual uh but first and foremost we want to give a shout out to jay from jersey he says i bought my tcl p series because of the extraordinaire david katzmeyer's recommendation so you definitely have one fan out there david awesome you have okay two fans all right well, <laughs> my mom i'll count myself she, she bought my tv the tv <laughs> really oh three that's great <laughs> We're growing my channel. <laughs> right. That's awesome. Exactly. <laughs> uh, all right. So uh, the first question we're going to take is from Timothy. He says, is there a TV out there that has more than four HDMI ports? I, I like this question because in the trend where computers are doing away with any kind of port activity and everything's going wireless, albeit with a bit of a bumpy road. Don't get me wrong. I hate wires, so naturally I took a career in audio engineering. Uh, but this whole problem with like being able to actually connect devices and many generations of devices. Are there TVs out there with lots and lots of ins and outs? Well, yeah, there's uh, one I can think of off the top of my head, the T uh, Vizio P-Series and the Vizio PX-Series, uh, P-Series Quantum. Those have a uh, five uh, HDMI, but they really don't get much more than that. Uh, you can throw on an HDMI switch for, for like 20 bucks. We have a yeah, great article I have about one. that. Yeah, yeah, if you run it at inputs. Um, of course, it's a pain, like Brian, Brian was saying. At the end of the day, uh, most TVs, though, max out at four, even the most expensive ones. Yeah, but like you said, um, don't feel the need to overspend to get more ports because you can get uh, like an outside port, you know, a switch pretty pretty inexpensively. Yeah, and they have remotes and they make it pretty easy. But, mm -hmm. you know, again, you're dealing with a second box. So yeah. uh, next coming in, we're going to talk to Yan. He uh, asks, well, he states, I wonder if there is a practice of increasing the price before a sale like on Prime Day just so that they can justify the excuse to apply a discount for an artificially you know, inflated I, I price. I hear that a lot. Yeah. I, I was doing a lot of like radio hits during Prime Day, and that is the baked in assumption that a lot of people have, especially around Prime Day, because it's this random made up holiday, sales holiday in July. So they just assume that the price will get jacked up and then they'll lower it and yep. make it seem like it's an actual sale. If you're really that concerned about that, there are uh, comparison websites like camelcamelcamel.com, which will legitimately let you know what the price comparisons have been over the past 30 or 60 days. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to feel like you're, you know, getting duped or something by by these uh, companies. The other thing is, is that with Prime Day specifically, it's become such a competitive Christmas in July type of thing that uh, it would surprise me if they're all just making up their sales because mm -hmm. they're all like desperately trying to get sales during the slow summer season. Yeah, and, and another factor is that TV manufacturers, major manufacturers like Samsung, they dictate the price. Like they're the ones who set the price. And so the price will be the same no matter what retailer are looking at. If there's gonna be a spike and then you know a fall to get it to a discount level, 
uh, you know, that's going to be uh, determined by the manufacturer. And I've really never seen manufacturers do that. They, they generally just keep going down and down and down yeah. throughout the year. Right. As they're, you know, like that model is starting to get long in the tooth and they're getting ready to come out with the next model. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, one thing that I did want to ask you at, at this point is, is like, okay, so I'm looking at a 2018 model versus a 2019 model of yep. literally any type of television. Yep. Is there something in the 2019 model that's like a really must have in like this year's set that like I'm gonna miss a lot if I bought last year's model? No. So the 2018 <laughs> models are really similar to the 2019 models. TVs, I'll take a step back. TVs are, are pretty mature technology, much like phones, much like PCs. You're gonna do pretty darn well buying the slightly older one compared to the newer one. And there is, isn't a, a feature or a picture quality enhancement that I can think off the top of my head that is a must have. You're gonna get a slightly brighter picture, slightly more dimming zones, slightly better image quality. But for example, every OLED TV I've reviewed in the last four years has the same score in picture quality. Mm. And I just say, buy the cheapest one. Because, I mean, for example, there's a $300 savings now if you buy last year's OLED. The problem is, they start to go away, like we were talking about. So, you know, that they, uh, you know, lose stock and then the 2019s come in. So, yeah, I would say if that 2018 model is on sale, this is a great time to get it. Yeah, good point. Next question's coming from our old friend Srinjoy. Katz, do you like the new 8K TV from Sharp? Oof. Uh, first of all, I, this is, I've, I've heard about Sharp's 8K TVs, but I've never seen one in person. Uh, 8K in general is a waste of money. Uh, if it has, you know, full array local dimming, uh, some some things that can improve the image quality besides that 8K, sure, I'd, I'd be willing to consider it. But I'll take a step back. The, the Samsungs uh, out now, the 8K Samsungs, 8K Samsungs do have full array local dimming and do have uh, some really good picture quality chops uh, based on the reviews that I've done on the 4K models. And you know, I did a kind of hands-on of the you know, $15,000 85-inch 8K Samsung. So those uh, really, I think, do have a great picture. But you know, that thing's $3,500 for a 65-inch. Maybe the Sharp is a little bit cheaper at that size. But again, at that size, 8K resolution will give you even less of a benefit than it would, than it would at 75 inches. And again, no 8K content. Right, that's what I was gonna ask about is, is that primarily do you think that it's a waste of money because there's really no 8K content to actually yeah, that's Watch. one of three reasons. One of three reasons? <laughs> one, one, okay, another, I got one of them. Right, and another one is is the fact that 8K is almost to the point of diminishing returns. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to tell the difference for most people between a 1080p and a 4K TV uh, at a normal seating distance. Well, with unless I'm watching like size. a David Attenborough show. You right. Know, and then, then you're like, oh, wow, like what an amazing waterfall. But otherwise, if I'm watching, you know, just regular television yep. or like some sort of like... Uh, you know, crime drama or whatever. Like, am I really going to notice the difference? Not really. Right, and and there's so many other factors besides just the resolution. For example, Blu-ray 1080p can look much better than 4K streaming in a lot of circumstances. Mm. Um, but you know, long story short, 8K is a lot of money right now, and very little content, and and it's hard to see the difference. So, you know, I, I think most people shouldn't really even be considering it now. Mm. Boy, the questions are really plowing in now. Uh, as oh, yeah, a follow-up to 8K, Imagine Soggy asks, when will 8K TVs become more readily available for purchase? Well, you can buy them right now at Amazon, 3,500 bucks for a Samsung 65. Uh, that said, we're gonna see more manufacturers jump in. Uh, you know, I don't think we're gonna see ex inexpensive 8K OLEDs anytime soon, but I do expect to see TCL. Uh, they announced at CES that they'd be playing in the 8K arena this year. Uh, we'll see an announcement from them probably pretty soon, hopefully, because you know it's getting on in the year. Uh, and Vizio said that they're not doing any 8K TVs this year, so Sony is obviously selling 8K TVs for ridiculous amounts of money. Uh, so those are kind of the big U.S. manufacturers, and if you just go down the list, you're you're still waiting on the discount brands to, to step into the arena. So we'll see that probably 2021 uh, or next year. You know, it's 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 going to come and it's going to come fast. I mean, just judging by how quickly those Samsungs have come down in price, they started at five thousand, now they're thirty five for the sixty five inch TV. So still eight, a lot of money. It is. It's it's crazy, but. Those AK TVs, just like the 4K TVs before them, you, before before you know it, you'll be able to afford one. So related to diminishing returns, 8K is already a scenario in which those diminishing returns. Is your expectation that at some point that game is going to stop being played? 
you know, because we went from 1080p mm -hmm. to 4K, now they're starting to play in 8K. Right. I'm assuming 16K is the next that's, step. That's the next step. So. Right, but like 8K already seems a little bonkers to me. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like the whole thing with megapixels on phones yeah. that they're just going to move on to a different type of technology at some point and stop emphasizing this, I don't know, whatever the K is. Right, yeah, so I, I agree uh, 16K is kind of crazy to think about, um, but who knows? I mean, it, the thing about LCD technology is that it's really easy to make those tiny pixels, and you know, there, there's a lot of issues actually between 4K and 8K, for example, you lose brightness significantly when you go to 8K uh, with mm. the same backlight power uh, powering a 4K TV just because there's more of a grid, there's more pixels to deal with. Wow. So that's a factor. Um, so yeah, eight, 16 is again going to be four times as many pixels, uh, that much more of an issue. So it's uh, not going to be as bright. Well, again, for the same amount of backlight. So you can always throw more LEDs back there and suck more power out of the wall, but uh, you're going to get, just for the same screen size, uh, different resolutions that have different efficiencies. And, so, and also, I, I guess it would impact your, your electric bill, but at the same time, if you're affording an 8K or hypothetically 16K television, that's right. not really going to harm your budget. And TVs are pretty efficient now. So that's just that's just one thing. I mean, there's a couple of other things where I feel like the main issue is bandwidth. So you're talking about streaming. Uh, mm -hmm. 8K streaming uh, requires a heck of a lot more bandwidth than 4K streaming. And again, the, the returns are so small that the guys on the production side, on the streaming head end, are going, is this worth it? You know, uh, uh, what am I doing here? You know, why I, I, we're not even at a real penetration of 4K yet. That's what so. I was just about to ask you, is, is that there are only a handful of Netflix shows, please correct me if I'm wrong on this, yeah. there are only a handful of Netflix shows that are actually streaming in 4K at this point. Yeah, right? and Netflix is the best case scenario. They really do have the most 4K content. Uh, iTunes is another great one. They have a lot of 4K with HDR. Uh, but when you go beyond those two, it's 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 pretty hit or miss. Amazon has a few; uh, they're ramping up. But again, it costs all these guys a lot. Uh, you can uh, you can make it up by having a higher pricing tier, for example, charging more for a uh, 4K movie uh, like they do on uh, Vudu. But you know you're not. Uh, it, it's it's it requires a lot more bandwidth, uh, and sometimes when you're watching, it can step down. So mm -hmm. you can imagine if you're watching 8K, it'll step down to 4K unless you have a really really fast internet connection. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that really puts the limit on it. Mm. A natural segue into the next question, uh, which is coming from Jay from Jersey. Uh, when do you think we'll get 4K TV channels? I hear they're going to broadcast next year the Olympics. Yeah, so that's uh, what we were just talking about. The issue with uh, producing live TV is even more apparent than it is with streaming. So, you know, you don't, there's literally nothing you can get. There's some sporting events. Uh, the Olympics is a good example. Um, they've, they've done some of these things as kind of one-offs. But getting the carriers to come along and produce them, Fubo TV is one of these live TV streaming services that have done a couple things in 4K, for example. Direct TV historically has done more stuff. Uh, but you, to get this widespread penetration for example your local cable company to deliver that requires you know them to do some upgrading and you know to get uh, you know that the obviously more buy-in from these TV shows so you're asking for a timeline I, I would be surprised if in 2020 or even 2021 you saw um, a major network or you know a TV channel try to go nationwide 4k I, I think it there's just no real impetus for it Streaming could make it happen a little bit sooner, you know, live TV streaming in 4K. Um, but again, uh, it's, you know, there's really less demand for it than there ever was. So, yeah, best guess, maybe somebody will come along and do it in, in you know, two years. Is there, uh, is it easier to do uh, using an antenna service? At all? Yeah, so that brings up ATSC 3.0, which is the new broadcast standard for over the air antenna, and that includes 4K. So we just did a big update of our ATSC 3.0 article. Long story short, they're actually starting test broadcasts. There's a, a couple across the nation now where they're doing tests of 4K over the air antenna. Um, there is a lot more bandwidth there. So you don't have to worry about getting in it through a pipe and, and you know getting truncated when everybody else in the neighborhood is streaming at the same time, that sort of issue that happens with internet. But it all, requires all new hardware, it requires the station to, to get on board. It's a voluntary mandate, which means that it's just gonna be in a few uh, parts of the country and guys that are willing to experiment. And you would, uh, for the customer, would they have to get a new antenna yes. to be able to? Oh, wow. Well, no, 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 sorry. The antennas work fine with okay. ATSC 3.0. That, that, antennas are dirt cheap. Hey, the thing you have to spend up on is the tuner. 
So there is no ATSC 3.0 tuners available in the market right now. None of the TVs will tune it. Uh, if you want to watch ATSC 3.0, uh, 4K over the air using your current television, your current 4K TV, you're going to have to buy a little adapter box like we did 15 years ago and we switched over from, you know, uh, normal standard def to high def broadcasting. You need these little tuner boxes to do that. You'll need the same thing mm. for the new over the air thing. Those tuner boxes aren't available. They'll probably come out next year. My God, you know a lot about televisions. <laughs> I'll stop. Needless to say, the Daily Charge will start broadcasting in 64K starting tomorrow. Uh, oh, Jay, from, nice. Jay from Jersey asks, what do you think about the format wars between HDR, Dolby Vision, and HDR Plus? Ooh, I love that. This is, you're, you're tuned in, Jay. Um, so, format wars. Yay, is it really, format wars. Is it really a war when you can flip a software update switch and suddenly get compatibility? Because uh, we, the original format war was the beta versus VHS, right? And you had to buy a, you know, a thing with the tapes and commit to this whole... Uh, one or the other. With uh, this, I think it's a little bit less of a war. There's still something going on. The main issue is that Samsung, the world's largest TV maker uh, by every measure, just doesn't want to do Dolby Vision. So they're because the, they're a competitor? Yeah, they, they've told me that they want to, they just don't want to pay the money. And, and, and they want to keep it open format. They have their own uh, competitor Dolby Vision called HDR10+, which very few people are even using. In fact, Amazon recently started to, you know, they have all their stuff in HDR10+, and now they're starting to support Dolby Vision more by selling these Fire Edition TVs that have Dolby Vision. Both. Yeah, right? yeah, at so, the same time. So they'll they'll do well. Those won't do HDR10 plus, interestingly enough. So that, that's an either or situation huh. for those particular TVs. But biggest picture is that Dolby Vision is out there on most TVs. Uh, a lot of streaming services. Netflix is a huge proponent of Dolby Vision, and they totally don't care about HDR10 plus, for example. iTunes again, huge supporter of Dolby Vision. Um, so these guys and Hollywood, which is really the main, main thing. We talk about movies. We talk about what studios are supporting. They really are all behind Dolby Vision. So I think that's where the momentum is. And, and whether or not Samsung caves, they can kind of do what they want. You know, they're Samsung. They really do rule the TV roost. But uh, if I was a betting man, I'd say, you know, in a year or two, they decide to support Dolby Vision too, just because it's, it's going to become more and more ubiquitous. Without knowing too much about the technologies themselves, I'm personally much more pro Dolby Vision just because it's a much better name. Right. But it know. is. And it's Dolby, and Dolby's pretty powerful. Yeah. You know, they're they're the, the standard for everything audio. You know, in, in Hollywood, and they have a lot of power uh, on the production side. And you know, really, I've done some comparisons. It's hard for a lot of people to tell the difference. It's hard for me to tell the difference uh, if the TV does a good job. At the end of the day, the TV and Samsung makes some really good TVs. Uh, you know, when they're showing uh, their normal HDR, HDR10 plus. Uh, video, it looks great, uh, whether you know, without being Dolby Vision. So yeah, Dolby Vision has some inherent advantages, but it's not going to knock your socks off. It's really about the display itself. Hmm. Uh, opinions on Sony Bravia? Uh, we're reviewing one now. Uh, I, I might make you wait uh, for that opinion, but uh, it all depends on the TV. Uh, you know, it's hard to say one brand is great, but Sony in general in the past hasn't been the greatest value uh, just because you know, uh, Samsung does a lot of that stuff, uh, you know, for the premium market well uh, that Sony does. If you're talking about their OLEDs, again, they're, they're a few hundred dollars more expensive than the LG OLEDs. Picture quality, not necessarily that much better in terms of, you know, whether it's worth it or not. Uh, Sony does have Android TV, if you care about that, with built-in Google Assistant and all that stuff. Um, but, you know, I think there's a reason why they're, they're underselling compared to the Vizios, uh, TCLs, and Samsungs of the world. Is is that you know they they they're relying on their brand uh, to be um, great and you know they do make some excellent televisions but at the end of the day not great bang for the buck. Yeah, I have always noticed that the Bravias are just a premium yeah. above as far as pricing is concerned, which is yeah. why I typically avoid buying them. You know, yeah. like Sony has. It, it's I, I totally agree with what you said. Sony has been you know kind of a gold standard in tech and picture quality for a long time, but it sounds like there are just a lot of other competitors in the market that are doing just as well as them, if not better, yep. especially when you consider the pricing. Yeah, and we do side-by-side -side comparisons, and you know, sometimes the Sonys are better in some areas and worse than some areas, and they're not gonna be head and shoulders above it. Um, right, but when you're talking about, okay, so let's compare on the OLED front between with LG, mm -hmm. how much money are you talking about as far as a price point difference? Like you're talking about two, $300, or as much as 500? 500 for like a, a 55, 
65, 65. I mean, I honestly, I haven't looked at the pricing on the, the newest Sonys, but there is a premium there. And like I said earlier, if once you get into OLED, I tell most people to just buy, uh, you know, the least expensive one because it's, it's good. so good. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's the TV LG's least expensive OLED that's won our Editor's Choice Award the last two years for that exact reason. It's it's so much better that the, the ones that are slightly better are a couple hundred bucks more and not really worth it. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and boost this one right up to the top of the list just because I like it. Stringjoy asks, Cats, which TV among the latest that you've checked out is the best audio without plugging in external speakers? Uh, so I'll be 100% honest. I literally watch them in silence. I don't <laughs> test audio, full stop. <laughs> Uh, we used to. We have audio people here. Right. Ty, we'll, we'll have Ty on. Yeah, no, Ty's, uh, he's tested a few uh, listen to speakers. I used to make him come in and listen to every TV and do a whole audio thing. Not because I'm deaf, but I just don't care. Sorry. <laughs> Um, but you know, it's 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 it, the reason I don't care is because you can buy an amazing soundbar for a hundred dollars or a, a very very good soundbar that will kick the butt of any TV. Mm. Uh, for yeah, the, the Vizio, the, our editor's choice soundbar is a hundred bucks now. So, you know, I, I literally can't answer that question. Mm. Sorry. Then try answering this one. Uh, Commander Trium wants to know what are the best TVs out there that do wireless well, specifically being able to broadcast video from the PC reliably within an apartment scenario to the TV. Is, that for, is that for gaming? Uh, why, would you, why would you want to do that? Maybe he's talking about DLNA, uh, if he has a bunch of videos on his server on certain provenance that he wants to stream to that, uh -huh. Plex potentially. I, I mean, again, wireless is very similar among the TVs that I've tested. Uh, you're not going to get uh, generally better wireless performance uh, from one TV to the next. Again, the, the Roku's that I've tested do very well for wireless. They have pretty rock solid connectivity. Um, uh, the biggest factor, as always, will be your wireless network. Uh, and probably even the wireless connection, or if it is wireless, from the PC to the wireless network. So on the TV side, tough. I really can't tell you one's better than the other. CKT wants to know, uh, well, he says, I love when a TV has really insane soap opera motion flow. Are there any OLEDs that you would recommend that has that ability, like the Sony XBR? So I, I, I didn't know people... Like oh, that. there's people out there. People like the soap opera. Effect. Oh yeah, yeah. Tom Cruise goes to their house, knocks on their door, and personally yells at them. Yeah. Um, every single one of them. He just travels the country doing this to people who like the soap opera effect. So watch out, uh, caller. You're gonna get Tom Cruise knocking at your door. And remember to look down seconds. when the door knocks. Oh no, you're he's very short. <laughs> <laughs> and then he'll give you a noogie and be like, "Come on, man, I'm Top Gun. Turn off soap opera effect." Um, Tom doesn't like it, I don't like it, uh, but if you like it, you can always turn it the heck on. So, for example, Sony has a setting that you can crank it up, uh, it's adjustable, you can turn up that buttery smoothness to your heart's content, LG does as well. So, they're both very similar, they're both super duper my, duper my smooth. My TCL has it, yeah. the 6 Series has it, yep. I turned it off almost immediately because I was like, what's going on here? Yes. Are there certain types of uh, content that work better for the soap opera effect than others? I mean, like they must have created this feature for something. So is it is it for live sports or is it for movies? Like, what's it? I'll tell you why they created it, friend. Because it's a feature that has a higher number. So there's a thing called Hertz, which refers to refresh rate, which um, you can put on a TV and say 120 Hertz or 240 Hertz used to be a thing, uh, and and now they have even higher numbers that are not associated with Hertz. You can get to those numbers by uh, interpolating and increasing um, the smoothness uh, with one of these soap opera effect features. So again, you can have a really good 120 hertz TV and turn it off, uh, but it's one of the things, especially earlier in TV, where they really touted it. And there's some people who, who look at Judder, for example, when a camera pans over something and go, you know what, our eyes don't do that. Um, you know, and, and James Cameron and Mark Jackson are, are, are people that, did I say Mark Jackson? Uh, the yes. guy who did The Hobbit? Is he the, is it Peter, Peter Jackson. Peter Jackson. Jackson. Oh, that's right. Okay. Two basketball people to one director. <laughs> but anyway, those guys, those two directors are a big proponents of high frame rate video. Mm. Uh, Ang Lee did the um, Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk. Uh, that movie, which nobody saw, but it's pretty well known among video dudes because the 4K Blu-ray is in 60 frames per second. If you sit down and watch that thing, it's the smoothest, craziest thing you've ever seen, but the director wanted that. So, you know, it's it's a thing that some people like, uh, but, you know, I don't. To me, neither. Television is how many frames per second? 60. 
So every TV refreshes at six. Most, you know, the least expensive TVs refresh at 60. The, the step up models refresh at 120. And then there's a lot of processing that goes into making video look differently depending. So 24 doesn't go evenly into 60. So there has to be a little bit of stuff going on there. But it usually looks really good. Uh, it does go evenly at 120. Um, so, you know, you can get uh, the perfect, um, you know, frame rate. A conversion look exactly like film, but you know, again, most these TVs, if you turn it off, it looks really, really good. It looks like film should, and that's kind of all most people need to care about. Mm. I'm with you, cats. It's funny. There's a lot of people chattering about the Hobbit in the chat today. Uh, speaking of the chat, there's no way in hell we're going to be able to get to every single question in here. Uh, there's so many great ones piling in, which I guess the proof is just in the pudding. We need to have cats back on on the regular. Um, Meow. Let's take two. <laughs> Two more. Sirinjoy says Netflix recommends 25 megabits per second for 4K streaming. Do you think broadcasters and producers will look into nationwide internet subscription charts and say, nah, they're lagging behind? Where does Sirinjoy come up with these questions? Do you have the answer to this? Uh, I didn't. I kind of lost track of the question. So I, I know they, they charge a lot. It's about whether they're... Sorry, can you repeat that? Yeah. Sure. It's uh, Netflix recommends a 25 megabit per second for 4K streaming. Do you think broadcasters and producers will look into nationwide internet subscription charts and say, nah, that's lagging behind? Um, as in they'll want to maybe have more bandwidth? I don't know. I, I feel like it. maybe he's asking whether... Our producer's going to keep pushing that envelope so that they have to... Uh, so that inter internet providers have to compensate for the uh, higher quality of video. Yeah, it, and that's actually a, a good question now that you put it that way. So I'll, I'll tell you a little story. I was sitting at a, 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 a conference and there was a dude from Comcast there, right? There's a big nationwide provider of, um, of bandwidth for, for internet. And he goes, yeah, we love 4K streaming because it allows us to essentially charge people a faster internet packet. Anything that will um, you know, increase the public's demand for bandwidth uh, is a good thing as far as those guys are concerned. This is, yeah, they just increase their monthly subscription rate. And yeah. once you've upgraded to that level, you're far less likely to downgrade at that point. And, and it just it provides you know, more impetus to uh, think you need uh, faster internet. So, uh, you know, it, and uh, those guys are all behind it. I think, again, the big roadblock is is the infrastructure side, is, is the customer demand side. Um, and, you know, it, it, especially with live uh, TV, I, I feel like that's still a, a pretty big hurdle for these guys to get over. All right. And final question from Timothy. What is the next tech after LG's OLED? Ooh, that's a great one. I'm going to go with micro LED. Yes! Micro LED. I was going to say that. I oh, wow, I have ben. an answer to something. Let's hear it. That's the last time that we talked about. You, the last time we had you on, if I recall correctly, we did an entire show almost entirely on micro LED. We did. And uh, talking about what the value of the technology is. If I remember correctly, micro LED is the exact same type of technology that they use in arenas where it's just those giant screens. What they're trying to do now is shrink them down and turn them into you know, TV technology. Yeah, uh, we, so the latest on micro LED, and I had to look this up even though I wrote it, um, the, the Samsung has started selling uh, the micro LED TVs. Uh, again, they haven't really officially told us any pricing. They say you have to call them up to get the price, which is so. Which means that it's it's six figures. So you know, and and the technology is great because it it supposedly looks as good as OLED, but no burn-in issue. Uh, you can get a larger screen size. It's modular. All this crazy future stuff. Did you say six figures? Yes, a hundred thousand dollars for a television. Yeah. Well, they're huge. Um, what is this? The, the oh, consumer, like the, like the wall, the wall that they were showing off at CES two years ago. Yes, that, yes. That was so, a micro LED. Well, that thing is even more. I mean, it, at the end of the day, these this is a brand new TV technology. Only one guy is making it, and it's you know, uh, it starts I think at seventy three inches for this one, which is actually pretty modest. Um, I mean, right now you you pay uh, seventy grand for a ninety eight inch eight K TV. So if non micro LED, just random, you know, LCD. So anything that's a really really big TV starts to get really 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 expensive. Say those numbers again. Seventy eight grand for what? Seven seventy thousand dollars for a ninety eight inch 
8K LCD TV from Sony and Samsung. Is LCD, it's not even an OLED? No, just normal, normal LCD, but it's uh, 8K and it's 98 inches. Who and buys, at that price point, who's buying them? I, none of my friends. Nobody you know. Nobody okay. I know. All right. Yeah, um, maybe I want to get a really nice sports car at that price. Yeah. Of television. And there's, a, there, or pay for, you know, a, a semester of college. <laughs> Just uh, one semester. <laughs> But yeah, it's it's it, th these prices are insane for the really big TVs, and micro LED is going to be unaffordable for a long time. But it's a great, uh, I think it's going to be potentially the next successor to OLED. But it's it's at least four or five years down the road right. before we can talk about OLED it. is not even moved into the mid market at this point. Yep. So yeah, that's there's there's still time there. Yep. All right, we are completely out of time. We are yeah. well over time, but uh, this proves that we're going to have to do these uh, ask the S expert source code segments a lot more often uh maybe we'll have like ackerman on next time or scott stein talk about wearables or something like that but cats the door is always open for you it's always a pleasure to have you yeah. uh thanks guys for sure and uh ben want to go ahead and take us home yeah sure thanks again uh for joining us feel free to find us online we're pretty easy to track down let us know what you want to see more of or less of here on the show for the daily charge i'm ben fox rubin david katzmeyer thanks for listening <laughs>